Hello. Um, welcome to our discussion of ethics. I'm Miles Bissell. This is Doe Fisher and Hershey Friedman. And we're professors at Brooklyn College's School of Business. What we want to talk to you about today is how ethics can and should influence your decision-making process. So let's look at um, some examples. Here's one. Uh, I'll read to you this example, and uh, let's uh, get you to think about what's the right thing to do. Not necessarily what's legal, but what's ethical. Imagine that you work for a hamburger company, and in fact, this restaurant, this hamburger company, has a hundred locations in California. However, there's a drought in California. Now, as part of the hamburger making process, we use a lot of water. Let me give you some of the information. All right, so there's this drought and the government is saying that people need to use less water. What are the implications for us as an organization? Or maybe you think there is no implications. It takes 1,800 gallons of water to produce one pound of beef. So remember, we're selling hamburgers. 1,800 gallons of water to make one pound of beef. Even if you don't know anything about the industry, it sounds like a lot of water. All right, so it's only going to take 12 gallons of water to produce a head of lettuce. So we have to think about the way we define our business. What is our business? Do we sell hamburgers? Are we a fast food restaurant? Now, 12 gallons of water to produce a head of lettuce, two gallons of water for one walnut, and 468 gallons of water to produce a pound of chicken. So 1,800 gallons to produce a pound of beef, and 468 gallons of water to produce a pound of chicken. Let's say we discuss this with the executives. So you work at this organization and you discuss it with the executives in your firm. And they tell you that the way water is allocated by the government, the company is not going to incur any additional expense for the water that it uses during this drought period. And that water is going to remain very cheap for our business. So even though the government is asking people to use less water, the fact of the matter is, is that the cost to our business, to our company, is going to be unchanged. So you, as the executive, as one of the key executives, asks for ideas for a strategic plan for the future. So in other words, are we going to change the definition of our business? We're we going to change the way we operate. Are we going to do something different? Are we going to sell other products instead of hamburgers? Maybe products that use less water to produce. So what do you think? We're going to talk about that a little bit now. Thank you. So um, I think the, uh, the question is, um, what is, um, what is our strategic advantage as a company? Um, are we simply trying to uh, take advantage of government subsidies, or are we trying to add uh, value by producing a product that meets the stakeholders' needs? Uh, and the stakeholders is not just our customers or shareholders, but also uh, the larger community, the states, anyone else who's, uh, who, who relies on water to survive. That's, that, that would be my approach to, to uh, solving this question. And I would think the same thing, corporate, corporate you know, social responsibility is about considering all the stakeholders. And you got to look at the future. Again, if you're thinking 10, 15 years ahead, or even less, you got you realize that maybe some, eventually water is going to be very costly. Maybe you could figure out a way to use less water or some kind of substitute. Or figure out a way. That's Again, this is the logic of Toyota when it came up with the hybrid, the Prius, and, and you know, immensely successful product. Because they found a way to create a product that actually helps the environment, or at least it's not so harmful, and uh, that, that's the, the best way to go. You can't always assume you're going to be using lobbying and bribing government officials or whatever it takes to keep getting these subsidies. Eventually they may disappear when water becomes very costly. 
And uh, look, they're talking about desalinization. That makes water very expensive. Countries that are using it, it's, water is quite expensive. So you got to think of, uh, again, take a socially responsible approach. That's what I would recommend if they ask me what to do. Well, for the moment, you have no choice. If this is the way you make your hamburgers, and uh, right now water is cheap. You know, for the short run, okay. But the company has to think in terms of the long term. In the long term, you know that something's going to happen. You can't go on like this forever. And that's the idea of sustainability, which you mentioned. What's going to, you know, you got to start thinking ahead. So you want your company to be around in five, ten years. So this information about um, the amount of water that we're using in our business, is that something that we ignore or is it something that requires us to take action? Are we going to develop a plan that's going to change the way we operate our business? Is it going to help us? Is it going to, is it going to maximize shareholders' wealth to be socially responsible in this situation? What do you think? It, means to be socially responsible or to behave in an ethical manner in this organization. Are we doing anything illegal by using 1,800 gallons of water? No, it's not illegal at this point, but is it ethical for our organization to consume that much water when we know that there's a drought in our community? Maybe um, it would be more feasible to sell chicken burgers says that uh, 468 gallons of water are used to produce a pound of chicken versus um, 1,800 for beef. And is that going to be a healthy alternative also for our customers, for our stakeholders? So think about what it means to be ethical and socially responsible, to be a good corporate citizen. Remember, in this scenario right now, it's not illegal to do what we're doing, but that doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. Think about that. What's the, uh, the other scenario we're going to talk about? Eight. Number is number eight is think about a, this situation where you're the CEO of a chicken processing company. Now, we talked about before about the needs and wants of our customers. What motivates customers to buy. We argue that, you know, ironically, being socially responsible or a good corporate citizen can help to maximize shareholders' wealth. But that's not the reason we feel, in general, you should behave in a philanthropic way or to be a good corporate citizen. But nonetheless, the VP of Marketing informs you that if you label your chicken as free-range, you can charge 20% more, so you can get a premium for the price that you're currently charging for your chicken simply by labeling it free range. And that's going to dramatically improve the profits of the company. You find out that all it needs um, is for us to open the door to the hen house for five minutes a day. So you say, well, what does that mean, free range? Well, we asked ourselves that question too. So according to the law, for a chicken to be raised in this free range environment, because you know, generally chickens are raised in a cage. And a lot of people feel that um, that's kind of horrible for them to live out their life in this cage. They can't go anywhere, right? They can't walk about. So um, an alternative that's been suggested is that they be allowed to come out of the cage. And that's where this idea of free range came from. But apparently the law says that all you need to do is to open the hen house for five minutes and then we could say that these chickens were raised in this free range environment. As it turns out, the chickens never really take advantage of this. They're so used to living in the cage that they never actually even go out, not even for those five minutes, which is really kind of a joke. I mean, that's not free range. You know, even myself, I thought that free range meant that they just were out all the time. <laughs> free range, right? So, um, the suggestion is that from the market executive that we label our chickens as free range. So, do you think that's unethical? Is it misleading people by um, labeling 
the chicken as free range? What do you, what do you think about that? Well, it's a good case where you're obeying the law, supposedly, mm -hmm. and the law, you know, uh, is in a, you know, at a very low level of ethics. And you know, we talk about there are other terms like that, that uh, illegally go something all natural. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really mean anything. Legally, it means uh, has some meaning, but the consumer thinks it means much more than it really says. Mm -hmm. Well, think? handmade. A lot of times, companies yes. say that something is handmade. Yeah, but what does that mean? What percentage of the product is actually handmade? And also, this handmade is actually lower quality than machine made sometimes. Mm -hmm. you know, we're talking surgery now, you choose a machine. So, again, a lot of it is just trying to you know, deceive the consumer. There's so many of these terms that sound really good. You know, we've mentioned cage feed doesn't mean what consumers think it means. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean the animals, the chickens are running around, having a great time, and uh, they're never in a cage. It's not a cage. <laughs> right. I mean, there's so many of these terms that are ambiguous and purposely meant to deceive. And I think, that, again, we're back to, you know, ethics. So you're following the law, but you're not being ethical. And, uh, you know. If, if 60 Minutes did a documentary about this, then this is your company, you'd be pretty embarrassed. It's an embarrassment, that's right. Uh, uh, you wouldn't be proud of your company. You wouldn't be proud of using a term solely that, again, natural, I mean, poison is natural, many of them are natural, <laughs> right. right? So you can say all natural and you put poison there. I mean, you take your shoe and chop it up and put it in a hamburger, it's all natural. <laughs> you know, that, you know, you're putting old, an old sock, maybe natural, you don't want that in your hamburger. Mm -hmm. But see, this is the kind of stuff you got to ask yourself, you know, uh, do you want to just obey the law? And this is what I think accountants uh, were doing and auditors, uh, you can tell us more about that, where they were just trying to obey the minimum you know, law, whatever the law required of auditors or accountants, but they weren't looking at the big picture, the spirit of the law, so uh, look what that caused, this great recession. Accountants love rules, and that's how we become accountants, but we're realizing that uh, rules are not enough. Uh, uh, what, what we really require is uh, to be trained and you can, this is something that we're yes. discovering, is that you can train people to become more ethical, to have higher character. And uh, part of it is having an organizational culture. And part of it is also in business schools to raise these issues, to make people aware. And, and that's what we're trying to do. Sadly, they did a study of the least ethical people in uh, college, and, you know, among college majors. And uh, economics and business majors are at the bottom of the list. Liberal arts, liberal arts majors are actually much higher than everyone else. Studies are showing that. A lot of it has to do with the way we teach, you know, our accounting and business courses. Maximizing shareholder value. That's the word maximization is not a good word unless you actually talk about the big picture, all the stakeholders. Like this would be a good example. You know, in, in business school they probably teach you, in most business schools, oh, you're, just, you're obeying the law. That's good enough. Why do you have to go beyond obeying the law? So now we're seeing what happens when people just obey the law. How many people went to prison for what they did in 2008, you know, with all these financial schemes? By the way, they haven't stopped. It's another thing that bothers me. You would think after they've almost destroyed the financial system, we came very close to a huge uh, depression. And now you, you hear about scandal after scandal with the banks, the LIBOR rate, which has been manipulated, and uh, there's uh, something now with currencies that they found that banks were manipulating. They haven't learned their lesson. They're still doing these things. There's so many scandals now, and uh, what's the latest one? Every, every time I open the paper, new scandal involving banks yet. When I was a kid, banks, bankers were known to be honest. They didn't make that much money either, by the way. Now they make tons of money, they become super wealthy, and they've lost all their ethics. It's all about making money, maximization of shareholder value. So, today what we... Um what we were hoping to achieve is to build your awareness of ethical dilemmas. Certainly, when you're in um, the workforce, you're going to encounter situations like this and many others where you're going to ask to be do something that is not the right thing to do. And you have to decide whether or not you're going to speak up, whether or not you're going to say no. And early in your career, it's very challenging because if you tell your boss no, Maybe that means you're going to lose your job. Your boss asks you to sign off on something that you know is not correct. So you are going to encounter ethical dilemmas. You are going to face uh, situations that are going to involve ethical parameters, and you're going to have to make a decision. So 
Today we wanted to try and strengthen your critical thinking skills and get you to think about these issues and think about the different parameters that are going to guide your decision because you're going to have to make a decision. You're going to have to decide. I could end with one person that I just wrote about. Uh, not well known in history. He only killed 10 million people. I guess that doesn't put him on the top of the list. But he's up there. And uh, the reason he's interesting, his name is King Leopold II of Belgium. The reason he's interesting is we know that Mao killed lots of people, Stalin, Hitler, we know, they, they, you know they're definitely in the top five in terms of how many people they've killed. But uh, uh, King Leopold II, he had no ideology. He did it for one reason, for money. And you can find, a, there's a good, on YouTube, you can uh, find a film that was made about him. And you can see the horrors that he inflicted on the Congo, all in the name of greed, because he wanted to get rubber, he wanted to make it cheap, and he used the... Uh, you know, the people lived in the Congo. By the time he was finished, I think it was 10, 15 years, 10 million people were dead. So anytime somebody tells you greed is good, tell them to go to YouTube and see the video. I think it's called Congo. It's called, uh, it has red rubber in there. The reason it's called red rubber, red is the blood, the, the amount of blood that was spilled. You know, they invented cutting off hands as a motivator. I don't know what the whole, the whole movie, but it's amazing what this man did. And they have statues honoring him yet in Belgium. You know, thankfully, people are defacing these statues now because they realize greed is not good. Look what this man did. A lot of that money went to Belgium, by the way. Also, it made him rich, too, at the same time. But anyway, anyone tells you greed is good, greed is no good. And throughout your career, you, you're not always going to make the right ethical decision. Um, you're going to make some ethical mistakes along the way. And uh, that's okay as long as you learn from them. Uh, so, uh, the danger is to, to make one ethical mistake after another, and pretty much you're uh, killing 10 million people, pretty soon you're killing 10 million people. I'm exaggerating a bit, but uh, you might be actually killing people by delivering an unsafe product. And nobody sets out to get there. So, hopefully, you'll become ethically aware so that if you do make an ethical mistake, you'll reflect on it and you'll decide, well, next time I will speak up to that manager. And, you know, and uh, be brave enough to, to, to say what I think. And maybe the manager will listen to me and, and uh, change his or her perspective. Well, some auditors back in 2008 didn't kill 10 million people. They killed 10 million jobs, a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those people, when you lose your job, studies show that one of the, uh, the depression that comes from losing a job is worse than losing an arm, believe it or not. It causes mm -hmm. such great depression and uh, I think managers should think uh, twice before they close plants or do things that cause jobs to be lost because it really has a devastating impact on people. A lot of them commit suicide. There are all kinds of horrors that come from losing a job. Mm -hmm. We forget about that. Yeah, that's another good example. Yeah. As a manager, as an executive, um, it's not just a number on a piece of paper when you decide that 500 or 5,000 people are going to lose a job. Those are real people that are going to be unemployed, and there's consequences from yeah, that. There's consequences. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, yeah. I agree with that. Even though um, I've been the proponent here for maximizing shareholder value, uh, once you have a corporation that's up and running and employing people, you do have your stakeholders, and you have a responsibility to all of your stakeholders. And, um, and, and too often in economics, they teach us about rational choice. that. You know, you plug the numbers into a computer and it tells you, boom, that's the right decision to make. And, you know, that kind of thinking comes from uh, Milton Friedman and the Chicago School of Economics. And what I've seen recently is somebody proposed the, the idea of reasonable choice, that there may not just be one rational choice, there may be a menu of choices you can choose of and uh, make the best choice for all your stakeholders, not just for uh, one set, set of stakeholders. You might remember seeing a movie called Wall Street. Uh, the main character, Gordon Gecko, is played by Michael Douglas. You've all heard of Michael Douglas, right? Well, if you didn't, you could still watch that movie. And one of the things that's um, become famous about um, something that Michael Douglas said is, greed is good. Now, what do you think about that? Well. Professor Friedman is going to share with us some thoughts about greed is good. Well, um, 
that statement, greed is good, has caused the Great Recession of 2008. People actually believed that this greed is good. We'll see where that are, the origin of that statement. And you'll see it, uh, Adam Smith never said such a thing. We'll see in a minute what he said. But sadly, that statement um, led to a Milton Friedman's statement. It actually comes from Milton Friedman's statement, uh, where he said that the social responsibility of business is to increase its profits. I'll read the entire statement. This, was, this appeared in the New York Times. And Milton Friedman, Nobel laureate, said, there's one and only one social responsibility of business to use its resources and engage in activities designed to increase its profits so long as it stays within the rules of the game, which is to say, engages in open and free competition without deception or fraud. Basically what he said is, a business has one job, make money, profits and not worry about anything else, try to find ways to increase its profits any way it can, not worry about employees, as long as it doesn't break the law, you don't have to worry about the environment, as long as you don't break the law. You don't have to worry about employees, just don't break the law. This is what he said. And this became the driving statement that, uh, in my opinion, not only in my opinion, others, led to the Great Recession of 2008. Let me hear what you have to say about that, because we uh, have alternative views. Sure. Uh, I, I, I agree that Milton, Friedman, uh, Milton Friedman's comments have built a whole a uh, stream of literature and a, a way of thinking in certain business schools, particularly the University of Chicago, that the, the, the stock market has it all right, and if we just let the stock market rule, we could uh, pay management whatever, whatever uh, the stock market dictates, and everything will be okay. But uh, on a very basic level, I think what Milton Friedman said, and even what Gordon Gekko said, uh, has a certain merit to it, because uh, first of all, greed is good. If greed gets you out of bed and motivates you to go to work, that's a good thing. Um, now, it becomes a problem if greed is the only thing that motivates you, and if it, if it causes you to, um, to look, look, look through other important values. Uh, as far as what Milton Friedman said is, um, well, can you argue with the fact that um, a business cannot survive if it didn't make a profit, as socially responsible as that business would be? Well. The problem is understanding the difference between two words, greed and self-interest. See, uh, in the movie, uh, Gecko said, greed is good. In fact, is it, uh, you can watch it on uh, YouTube, Milton Friedman speaking on the Donahue show, and he confuses the word greed with self-interest. The original quote from Adam Smith was, it's in The Wealth of Nations, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. This is where the famous idea of self-interest. Now, Adams has got it right. As we know, these controlled economies where the government does everything have not worked. I don't care what your professors say. Marxism is a failed system. You don't believe me? Go visit North Korea where they have no food. You need that kind of self-interest. You want the government's job is to encourage self-interest to let us. Do what we want to do. You want to open up your own business, yes, the government is there to help you with that. And not uh, say, we control business, we control everything. You don't want a government like that. So self-interest is very important. It's important. But self-interest doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. If I open my business, and, I'm, and I like the idea of having a business that makes me feel good about myself, and I certainly I want to make a profit too, that's good. But self-interest also means charity. Why do people give to charity? Most people give to charity because of self-interest, and it makes them feel good. Self-interest is not a bad thing. That's a mistake to confuse greed and self-interest. Greed is a bad thing. Greed is about me. Me, 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 and no one else. That's greed. And that led to a horrible philosophy called maximization of shareholder value. In every textbook, I once saw Corporate Finance, and I wanted to talk several times, and I couldn't believe that textbooks was saying this is the greatest philosophy. That you have to maximize shareholder value. That came out of Milton Friedman, too, indirectly. And uh, that all a company has to worry about is making sure the stock goes up. That actually caused the Great Recession of 2008. Because that was based on greed. Because then CEOs couldn't care less about the long-term health of a company. 
All that mattered to a company was that the uh, CEO should make a lot of money. And indeed, this is what we've been seeing for the last 20, 30 years. Here's an article. Top CEOs make 300 times more than the typical worker. It was never like this. This is all in the last 30 years. It used to be, in many countries, the CEO does make more than a typical worker, but 50 times more, not 300 times more. And in some companies, forget about 300, the ratio has gone to 600 to 1. All that matters is that the CEO should make more money. And they use accounting gimmicks. There's so many ways to manipulate this so that CEOs make more money. Now, what about the typical worker? Well, in many companies, they find ways to make sure the typical worker makes less, not more. And they're always looking at the wage theft is a national disgrace. It's a big problem. There are other issues. But the workers are underpaid in many companies, and they're fighting against the minimum wage laws, as you know. Finally, some of them have given in a little bit, and they're letting the minimum wage go you know, up a little bit. They say, we're going to pay $10 an hour. Without mentioning that the fact that in real terms, minimum wages have been going down. So, I'll let somebody else uh, contribute. So greed is not good. Altru By the way, the book's now that saying altruism is good. Altruism is healthy for a company, for a company to care. There's a whole field of care ethics, about caring about everybody around you. You know, look into it. You'll see that caring is actually very good. It's healthy for us. By the way, people get married. Why? Self-interest. But it's a good thing. It's done right. If you get married and you say, I'm getting married, it's only about me and not about my partner, that's not going to be a healthy marriage. But if you go in, you recognize it's self-interest. I love this person, and it's good for me too. So there's self-interest. Why do people have children? Self-interest. Right? It's self-interest. But is it a bad thing? See, self-interest is not greed. Don't make that mistake. Milton Friedman made the mistake. Everyone is making that mistake. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. I'm sure in all your textbooks, um, whether they're finance textbooks or accounting textbooks or marketing textbooks, there's always a discussion about maximizing shareholder wealth and increasing market share, um, increasing sales, the number of units that are sold, but how you do that is important. So what we're trying to emphasize today is that the decisions that you make are done in an ethical way. So it's not just um, at any cost that you increase the sales of your organization or increase your profit. So of course, as Professor Friedman is saying, of course the company wants to increase its profits, but at what cost? Where do we draw the line? Is it okay to sell a product that's defective, for example, a product that we know is defective? Is it okay to sell that product if it means that the company is gonna make money? So we're going to um, talk now about some alternatives. Yeah, but I want to add also one thing. The Jack Welch, the you know, legendary CEO of General Electric, he actually said, the dumbest idea in the world is maximization of shareholder value. Not me. He said, it's the dumbest idea in the world. He said, it's not about maximizing shareholder value, making the stock go up, because as, as Professor Fisher will show you, that. The account, their accounts know how to make stocks, you know, earnings per share keep rising, but it could have a huge harmful effect in the long run. He said what really matters is making a good product, and you know, that's what we talk about in the marketing concept, satisfying your customers. If you make a good product, I'm talking about a top-notch product, and you keep innovating and making the product better and better, as you know from the, the idea of the marketing concept, people come flocking to you. They want good products, right? I mean, look at Apple. It makes these great products. And uh, it's now the most uh, valuable company in the world, by far. We've never had a company with this kind of you know, market capitalization as Apple, because it makes a product that everybody wants. I have one right here, my iPhone. And uh, we all love their products. Except for a Taylor Swift, maybe. <laughs> okay, all right, well, okay, all right. A couple of exceptions, I shouldn't say that. But really, it's about maximizing. It's not about maximizing shareholder value. It's about maximizing customer satisfaction, among other things. So that's really what a company should be focusing on. What will make my company valuable in the long run? And not these financial gimmicks that make the stock go up uh, so I become rich through uh, my options. That's not the way you make a company healthy in the long run. You make a company healthy by making great products. Professor Friedman, I, I, yes. I agree with you that an excessive mm -hmm. focus on maximizing shareholder value mm -hmm. to the exclusion of other values will result in a company failing to maximize shareholder value in the mm -hmm. long run. 
Um, and I, on the other hand, I feel that maximizing shareholder value can be a useful uh, tool, it could be a useful goal for a company. Unfortunately, however, the term maximizing shareholder value has been used to accomplish objectives that do not maximize shareholder value. So an example of that is excessive CEO compensation. And it's not just the fact that CEOs are getting paid um, 300 times more than the ordinary worker, it's the incentives that companies put into place that, um, that bring about this CEO compensation. Uh, one example that uh, we discussed uh, recently was um, how many companies tie the CEO bonus to the earnings of the company. But instead of using generally accepted accounting principles to measure how well the company is doing, the CEOs, with the assistance of accountants, manipulate that measure of earnings. They say, okay, we're going to measure earnings before stock options, before other costs. And um, that's not maximizing shareholder value, it's not fair to workers, and it's not fair to shareholders either. So um, I, I, I think maximizing shareholder value um, is not the culprit. Uh, Milton Friedman is not the culprit. But it's the it's the one it's the focus on maximizing shareholder value to, to the exclusion of other values that is the problem. There's some truth to that because the behavioral economists talk about incentives, and they say that incentive you know in economic theory incentives are supposed to be very good, but they can boomerang if all you focus in on is the incentive. That's when incentives don't work. You should do some research on this, and you'll find out that incentives can boomerang and maximize. The way you said it is exactly right. The way the focus has been on maximizing shareholder value, basically to the exclusion of everything else. It's a total focus on the incentive. Really what you should be, what the, I think the idea behind it really was, I'm going to make sure my company is solid and stable you know, for the next hundred years by making the best products and bringing in the best people. And instead, what a, a typical CEO says, I'm not going to be here in a hundred years. What do I care about what happens in a hundred years? Let me just worry about the next couple of years because uh, what is the t typical tenure of a CEO? I think they're about Three years. Uh, whatever it is. Yeah, and I think the average CEO is about 55, 56 when, uh, when he or she becomes CEO. So how long are they going to be there? And most companies don't even have a life of more than 10 years. They get merged or whatever. So uh, they, you know, if they think of 10 years, as we know, some CEOs figured out ways to make a lot, a half a billion dollars and destroy their companies. Look up Angelo Mazzillo. He's the poster child of maximizing shareholder value with Countrywide Financial. He gave out these horrible mortgages, made a lot of money, for bonuses, and uh, made over half a billion dollars, and the company you know, is gone, of course, it's taken over, but uh, there's still lawsuits over this. But he's sitting on a half a billion dollars. So he maximized shareholder value, at least for his tenure. Right, and the compensation, um, when you look at the compensation package mm -hmm. of executives, um, and you look at the incentives, very often 50% of the compensation package is tied to these metrics. So they won't get their bonus. So if they're not maximizing shareholder wealth, that means that they might not get a 10 million, 20 million, or even $30 million bonus from the company. So there's definitely a big incentive for them to pursue that goal even though it's not in the best interest of the company, or ironically, in the best interest of the shareholders, ultimately. Uh, I agree with that. Um, for, many, uh, for many years, accounting researchers have looked at earnings management. And uh, it, earnings management is actually a negative term, where companies manipulate their earnings in any given year, uh, partly so that the CEO can achieve their bonus, so, and partly to meet the expectations of Wall Street analysts. I think we now we should talk about alternatives. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we are, we're agreeing that this, this, that type of maximizing shareholder value, where that becomes the exclusive focus, can only harm a company in the long run. But uh, what are some alternative strategies? Right, so we know it's important for us to recognize that that's been driving, that mentality has been driving decisions at, uh, at companies. But what about um, corporate social responsibility? Let's talk about corporate social responsibility. Okay, so let me just give you one definition, corporate social responsibility. It's an ongoing commitment by business to behave ethically, so notice business ethics is there, 
and to contribute to economic development when demonstrating respect for people, communities, society at large, and the environment. In short, corporate social responsibility marries the concepts of global citizenship with environmental stewardship and sustainable development. It's really about caring, it's something that we talk about the triple bottom line, which is another simpler way of at least seeing part of this. And we call it the TBL, triple bottom line. People, planet, and profits. It's about profits, you gotta make money. We talk about self-interest, you gotta have money to do anything. If your company goes bankrupt in a year, you're not gonna help anyone. So it is about profit, but it's also about people. When I say people, it means customers, it means your employees, and uh, you see it also means society at large, your local community, it, it, it's a broad people. But certainly it's about your customers, and, uh, and so we talk about profit, people, and planet. It's, you gotta care about the planet too, we'll see why in a moment, that why the planet becomes important. And uh, so if you're doing things and not considering the effect on the planet, some, it'll come back to haunt you. We see this now with water problems all over the country. So you got to consider the effects on terms of all kinds of resources, water, energy, and a forward-thinking company that's looking ahead 10, 15, 20 years is wondering about what will the water supply look like, the energy situation, you know, the planet, you know, the pollution. You know, one of our colleagues goes to China and he tells me he has to wear a mask. He has to wear a mask when he gets off the plane because the air is so bad. So now in China they're trying, they're rethinking, you know, they're making a lot of, you know, doing very well you know, financially and the uh, middle class is growing like crazy, good, but they still need air to breathe. All their rivers pretty much are polluted, so they're starting to rethink this uh, you know, the, the model of growth. It's, that's the word sustainable. It's got to be long term. Sustainable is not about two years, three years. It's about 50, 100 years. We've got to think ahead. So corporate social responsibility, triple bottom line, these are very important concepts. And uh, many of the forward-thinking uh, CEOs now are looking into things like this. So we can talk about the CEOs that actually uh, actually have this kind of vision. There was a recent uh, Fortune magazine article about the CEO of Pepsi, mm -hmm. who uh, 10 years ago started talking about obesity um, and uh, the, the dangers that her industry posed to public health. And uh, she's probably not doing enough, but she was very courageous 10 years ago in, in bringing that to the fore. And uh, that's what a leader does. And, and uh, in my opinion, ethics and leadership, um, th there are two terms that cannot be separated. Um, leadership is about ethics, and ethics is about leadership. It's not really about staying out of jail. That's, that's enlightened <laughs> self interest. <laughs> Yeah, I tell my students, um, I have no intention of visiting them at Rikers Island, which, um, um, as many of you know, is a, is a prison here in the, in the New York area. So um, it's about doing what's right, even when nobody is looking. That's integrity, doing what's right, even when nobody is looking. So um, you have to be courageous and stand up for what you believe in and what's ethical, even though... Um, it may not be the most profitable option for the company. As Professor Freeman pointed out, you know, this example about manufacturing, you know, it's okay to be um, a global provider of goods and to be a manufacturing powerhouse, but what about pollution? Is that considered acceptable? So your company is very profitable. Well, that's understandable in part because you're allowing a lot of um, pollution to be emitted into the atmosphere. So that's consequences. There's real consequences. So that's not um, a theoretical or hypothetical example. Here's a real example of companies that you could argue are not behaving responsibly and are causing a significant amount of pollution. They have a very large carbon footprint and that's going to have an impact on the environment and the people that live there for years to come. Many of those people will be sick, they might develop cancer, so there's consequences for our actions. I could even add to that. Uh, there have been studies on this and more than 50% of consumers claim that they avoid, they avoid buying products from companies because of what they feel is bad business behavior, bad corporate behavior. Look, I know what's going on with Walmart now. I get these emails all the time on some list. 
people are really angry at Walmart for fighting, you know, this idea of raising uh, the wage a little bit and uh, the way Walmart uh, treats employees. But there are a lot of examples of this. And now with the internet, people, if they're unhappy with the company, they make sure everyone knows about it. So you can actually lose a lot of customers down the road if you don't treat people well. I myself boycott certain companies. I, don't, I, I sense it when I walk into the store that people are just um, the employees are not happy. And then I go into certain places like Costco, for example, and people are really happy. They're friendly, they're warm, and I enjoy going into those kind of stores. I do not go into stores where I know that the employees have been underpaid, and, um, and this is a kind, you can sense it almost. Maybe you, I think you said that you saw an article about Walmart, but the new CEO is trying. Yeah, Tell us about that. Uh, Walmart has a new CEO. Uh, he's young, relatively speaking, for CEOs. He's 48. Uh, uh, he uh, acknowledges that Walmart has had issues with how they're perceived by the public in terms of where their values lie. And uh, he's intent on improving um, Walmart's practices. He's raised the minimum wage. And uh, he made another comment, and, and, and that struck me. He said, um, w w when there are these ethical issues out in the media, and the person comes to the store and is met with unfriendly employees, and the store itself is dirty, that just reinforces the uh, negative perceptions. And it pro it's probably related, right? You, you treat employees uh, badly, and their heart is not in, uh, in, in their job. So. Um, I think that shows that uh, ethical behavior and eth ethical leadership actually builds the bottom line, right, as, as, yeah. as you indicated. There are some studies that are starting to show that, they're starting to look into this, and employees that don't feel they've been treated well, what do they take it out on? They take it out on customers. So there is some evidence for that. And uh, actually, uh, talking about a good, let's talk about a good CEO, Mark Bertolini, he's CEO of Aetna. He almost died, so he suddenly realized he had to rethink his life. Uh, and uh, one of the things he did is he took the lowest paid workers at Aetna. Aetna's a huge company, an insurance company. He gave them, a, you know, gave everyone a 33% raise. The minimum wage at Aetna went from $12 to $16 an hour. And he also encouraged people to take yoga classes for free. He suddenly realized, uh, and by the way, he found that his health costs went down, and uh, he changed the whole company around. You, suddenly everybody likes going to work, they're happy, they're more productive, that's another reason. See, one of the terms that's become very important now is employee engagement. Let somebody else talk about that. When people like going to work, they're engaged, they love coming to work. These are the most productive employees. Tell us a little bit about engagement, what it's like when people enjoy going to work, because they're getting a good salary. Yeah, um, absolutely. You know, one of the things that managers have tried to do is to implement strategies of job enrichment where um, they're given responsibility at their level but also responsibility above their level so that they can grow into a position that has more responsibility and opportunity to earn more and contribute more at the organization. So it means that the company is focusing on promoting people within the organization instead of hiring people from outside the organization and that's going to motivate people um, because the company, as Professor Friedman mentioned, values people, planet, and profits. So is being corporate socially responsible in the self-interest of the company? You could argue yes. Is the company going to be more profitable? You could argue yes. If people are going to buy more of your product because you're a company that is environmentally friendly, then it's a good thing for the company. Now, we would argue, I think, that um, you should do it anyway. Uh, there's certainly some costs that are going to um, be significant for the company to absorb. Like um, we talked before about pollution. It's very expensive for a company to minimize the amount of pollution that they generate in a manufacturing process, but it's the right thing to do. Now, I want to go back to something Professor Friedman mentioned before about stakeholders. We talked about shareholders. You're all probably very familiar with shareholders. You know what a shareholder is, somebody who owns stock in your company. But Professor Friedman highlighted for us 
stakeholders, those are your employees, your customers, people in the community where you operate. So it's important to realize that it's not just about the shareholders. You see the difference? That's what we're trying to emphasize here about corporate social responsibility is that there's stakeholders other than our shareholders that need to be considered. Johnson & Johnson has a credo that guides their decisions and one of the things that they outline there is who their key stakeholders are and how important that is and that influences all their decision making. It was a while ago but they had an issue where their Tylenol, okay, Tylenol is one of the master brands um, that's owned by Johnson & Johnson, it's one of the products that they manufactured their Tylenol pain relief medication was tampered with in the store and um, people bought the product, they used the Tylenol, they swallowed it and then um, several people had died as a result of using the product and what they decided to do immediately the chairman stepped forward and had a press conference once they realized that this problem existed they didn't know what the cause of the problem was they didn't know if it was tampered with in their manufacturing facility or um, whether it happened in the store. What they knew was their stakeholders, their customers were at risk. People were dying. So that what they did was they recalled millions and millions of bottles of Tylenol. So as Professor Fisher was suggesting, they took a leadership position on ethics. They didn't try to sweep it under the rug. They stood up for what they believed in and they said, you know what's more important than profit? Although, don't think us naive. We're all um, faculty members of the School of Business. We understand it's important to make a profit, but at what cost? They said, you know what? It can't be at the cost of, of our customers. If our customers are dying, that's unacceptable. Now, there's other examples of where companies um, didn't take that action where they thought it was okay, they did a cost-benefit analysis, you guys know what that is, they did a cost-benefit analysis and they found out that, you know what, it would be cheaper to pay the death claims when the cars were rear-ended. And you know what happened? The cars were rear-ended and then they would blow up and catch on fire and people died. So that company, they decided, well, you know what, for us it'll be cheaper if we pay off the families of those people that um, were killed in those accidents instead of fixing the defect in the car which was actually very easy to repair but would have cost the company millions and millions of dollars. Yeah, we have that now with General Motors as you know if you've been you know, watching the, the news uh, they had a problem with their ignition switch and rather than replacing it you know, they did kind of subtly you know, change it but they didn't change the part number so there are thousands and thousands of cars with this uh, defective ignition switch. It suddenly turned off so the airbag didn't inflate. And now I think the, the, the death count is now up to, I think, uh, it's well over 100, I think 116 or something. I mean, a lot of people have died because uh, General Motors, the culture was, and they're trying to change that. The, the CEO now, she's trying to change the culture. She even talks about the, the culture that existed before she arrived. She called it the GM nod. The GM nod means, the old nod, it's another way of saying, yes, you're right, you're right, but they do nothing. And that's what they did. General Motors did absolutely nothing, and they knew they had a defective ignition switch. They knew that uh, actually millions of cars that had this bad um, uh, switch that only cost a couple bucks to replace. They didn't tell anyone about it, and now it's in the news, of course. And we have another big scandal now with the company uh, Takata, that uh, those are the airbags that explode, and suddenly you have shrapnel in your car. You know, these exploded. I think uh, they're up to 34 million recalls now. Here's a company also that was looking for a shortcut. They figured, yeah, not too many people will be hurt. We'll pay the, uh, probably figure that way. The lawyer said, keep it quiet. But, you know, you can't keep it quiet forever. And in any event, you shouldn't do it. It's wrong. You've got to worry about people. It's not just about profits. Mm -hmm. The right thing is to worry about, you know, people, planet, and profits, we're saying. That's the triple bottom line. And if you only care about profits, you you're very likely to have that GM nod. We basically have a nod, you do nothing at all. You know, that's a horrible thing. Yes? The key to, mm -hmm. uh, to a culture of ethics, mm -hmm. uh, in my opinion, is courage. Uh, you, you must have the courage uh, to speak out and say what you believe 
and the, the organization has a responsibility to create a culture where people uh, have uh, the ability to express themselves freely, even if what, what they say is not um, agreed to by other members of the company. So, actually, I admire statements like Milton Friedman, where he says, um, you know, a company has one objective, maximizing shareholder value. I may not agree with it, but here's somebody who, who puts himself out on the line and says what they truly believe. And um, in order to make these ethical decisions, you have to have a culture where people are not, don't nod and say, yes, uh, I agree. Uh, you, you need to let people express what they truly believe, and as a result, the company as a whole uh, will hopefully make the right decision as opposed to if people don't get an opportunity to really express themselves and there's a culture of fear and suppression in the company. There's another example of a CEO that has the right attitude. Uh, his name is Karlstrom. He's the CEO of Skanska. It's a construction company, a big one, a big construction company. And he personally says, you know, that the most important thing is the ethics, is this ethics, and diversity. He says those are the keys. He believes those are the actual keys to corporate success. And um, he says his company focuses on the five, uh, five zeros. Zero, they try to have zero accidents. They're not looking to cover up. They want to have zero accidents. Zero ethical breaches. Zero environmental incidents. Zero losing projects. This is profit. And zero defects. And again, the way to get that, to, to reach that level, is to have the right kind of employees. People speak out when they see something wrong. If everyone's terrified to point out a problem, you're not going to have that. So it's, it really is about having engaged employees who care. In fact, there's a lot of studies that are now showing people do want to work at a company that cares, that's socially responsible. And uh, social, social responsibility is a way of attracting the right kind of employees. People who are productive, will think of uh, uh, innovative ways of improving a product, making it safer. And these are the, the right kind of employees who want to do that. That's exactly what they want to do, is uh, work for a company that cares. It's about care. Mr. Friedman, what do you yes. think about corporate philanthropy? Is that something that is an integral part of social responsibility for a company to give, uh, to donate, uh, to prep, to uh, causes in the community or to the I society? Think, of personally, I, I, I know that some people don't agree with this. I think it actually is a good idea to care about the world, too. I know, obviously, a local community, no one's going to, well, I can say no one, but most people won't argue that a company has a kind of a responsibility. By the way, this is a kind of a myth that you know, corporations have no responsibility there, uh, because the reality is that uh, people have talked about this. They have been given something very valuable by society. We give them the idea of limited liability. You can't sue the corporation, uh, the owners. You basically, you can take away the shares, you can sue the company, but the owners, if I own a house and I have shares, you can't come after my house. This limited liability is something that's been given to companies. And uh, corporations, because of this, is one of the greatest inventions uh, is the corporation, the invention of a corporation. Remember, before you had corporations, uh, you couldn't do it, the world is there. Some of the, most, the wealthiest uh, entities we see are corporations. Some of, them, some of the corporations have more money than countries. Some of them are incredibly wealthy. So they've had, because of this limited liability, which is what society gives them, we give them the, the, this pri the privilege of limited liability. So we expect them to give something back. And as we know, many of these companies have figured out ways of not paying, we were just talking about this a little earlier, about not paying their taxes, they find ways to avoid taxes. It may not be illegal, but what kind of company are you? You know, here's a country that's giving you all these privileges, you make money and, you know, billions and billions of dollars in profits, and you try to figure out ways not to pay taxes. As you know, some of the wealthiest companies are not paying their fair share of taxes. So uh, you, you're the accountant, you could tell us a little more about that, about, uh, what they're supposed to be paying, and how much they actually really pay. My yes. concern is that companies yes. use philanthropy mm -hmm. as a smokescreen mm -hmm. and as a cheap way of getting, getting around not paying their fair share of taxes. So I'd rather see a company uh, not engage in philanthropy, but pay their fair share of taxes, meaning pay 35% uh, taxes in the United States, not keep their money overseas like the vast majority of large companies do, even those that are considered ethical, like Apple. Mm -hmm. um, uh, which has more than $100 billion parked overseas because they don't want to pay taxes on it. Um, so um, I think we agree that uh, we had a previous conversation that corporate philanthropy should be the last, the third and last element of 
uh, social responsibility. Uh, the first one should be uh, fulfilling the law and the spirit of the law. So not just paying your taxes as uh, your tax lawyer advises you, but um, saying to yourself, well, the intent of society was that I should pay 35% in taxes. Let me not go and uh, uh, con construct uh, triple, uh, double Irish and triple Dutch strategies to keep my uh, to keep my funds in Ireland and in Holland so that I don't have to pay taxes on it. Um, but rather pay my fair share of taxes, then uh, do what I can to serve my stakeholders, my employees, my customers, um, even shareholders. And then uh, if everything else is taken care of, uh, then engage in corporate social responsibility. My concern is that sometimes corporate social responsibility is used almost like lobbying. And, uh, you know, um, some people have, accused, have accused pre former President Clinton of, of letting uh, uh, miners and, and uh, other uh, corporations with, uh, with vested interests to, uh, to contribute to his uh, organization, and in exchange they got, they got uh, access. So um, personally, I don't think that the corporate social uh, philanthropy um, outside of local communities is something that we should really uh, uh, focus on. It's more important, uh, more importantly is, is the company paying its fair share of taxes, obeying the law, and, and really treating its stakeholders with, with respect. Actually, you've convinced me. I think now I have to agree with you that philanthropy should be the last thing you do. First, make sure you're paying your fair share of taxes, paying your employees a very good wage. You know, reasonably, you don't have to pay them, you know, $200,000, but you know, a livable wage. And, uh, you know, take care of your stakeholders, and then, a little bit to help the world, to show, it's kind of to show that you have the right spirit, that you do care, but really, if you're not doing the other things, if a company like Apple, that's uh, notorious for not paying its fair share of tax, I think General Electric is another one, but a lot of these companies that just are just uh, known for paying almost no taxes. I think Warren Buffett even made a joke about it, I mean, he cares about this, and he said something like, it's an embarrassment that I pay, percentage-wise, I pay less tax than my secretary. Mm -hmm. Warren mm -hmm. Buffett said that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there is something wrong about that. So, first pay your fair share of taxes. You know, it's, there's a reason it's 35%. And you've convinced me, too, that yes. if, if you've got all the other pieces in place, mm -hmm. if you want to do a little bit of corporate philanthropy to show where your values lie, I think that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, but th that shouldn't be the focus, right? Yeah. It's, it should be more like send in terms of sending a message to, to your stakeholders that yeah. you value the environment, you value uh, civil rights, uh, whatever it is that, that you, you care about. You know, and a lot of studies that are starting to show that companies who care about the environment and think a little bit ahead, they're the ones that the Toyota Prius, it doesn't lose money. They thought ahead of the hybrid. And so companies that think ahead, I mean, again, you're not going to make money right away necessarily, but you know, we know that the issues with water that are coming up, how many gallons of water, just make one hamburger, a huge amount of water is needed. And companies, are going to, when they start paying for water, it's going to happen soon enough, because California is having huge water problems. We're going to see them, uh, the companies that ha have a vision are starting to think ahead and say, what's going to happen 10 years from now when water is going to be very costly in, in our state? What's going to happen to the price of a hamburger, the price of a, uh, the, a walnut, or uh, things like that, they use lots of water. So that's, uh, that's part of uh, being a visionary, is to think way ahead and see what, you know, because you want your company to be around in 10 years, we hope. Right. It's, again, it's, it's not about yourself, it's about the company. And again, a byproduct of taking care of your company is that you're going to make more money too as a CEO. Mm -hmm. But that's not the primary uh, purpose of a corporation, is to enrich yourself. Yeah, and that's, Toyota Prius is a great example. I mean, that goes back to your point earlier about meeting the needs of your customer that there is a need for um, environmentally friendly products. And the reason that product is so successful is because um, consumers are purchasing that product and they're paying a premium. Consumers have demonstrated that they're willing to pay a significant premium for a car that's environmentally friendly. So think about what we're trying to emphasize today is that there are some legal obligations um, when you're working in an organization, you have some legal responsibilities. Of course, you don't want to do anything that's illegal, but we know that executives do things that are illegal, so they do things that um, are against the law. 
And also, we want to challenge you even a bit further because we'd like to think that not doing things illegal is um, already something that um, you find reasonable, right? Not to break the law. But now we want to push you further and say, you know what? It might be legal, and very likely, and very often it is legal, but it can be unethical, and we shouldn't do it. Think about decisions that you make um, at work, and think, how would your friends react if they knew that you made that decision? How would your neighbors respond? How would your children respond if they knew that you were um, how would you selling? Mean? Right, exactly. How would your mom, how would your dad feel if they knew that you made that decision? Sure, it's going to maximize shareholders' wealth, it's going to make the company more profitable, but there has consequences. It's impacting stakeholders. Again, not just the shareholders, but stakeholders, either the workers or people um, that live in the community. There's consequences. And what about this? Think about um, a situation where if the company does what's right, it bankrupts the company. Is that okay? Should the company go bankrupt? What do you think? Because I've heard students um, say this in class that, well, that isn't an option because if we did that and we recalled all those products, the company would go bankrupt. So which is more important? The lives of the stakeholders, the customers, or the company? So th think about that. Think about what's more important than the obligation that the organization has. If the organization, I would suggest, is not capable of operating efficiently so that they can make a profit but still be corporately social responsible, right? Try say not three times fast. Let's just say CSR, yes. right? Um, then maybe they shouldn't be in business. Maybe they should go bankrupt. If they can't manufacture a safe product, then maybe they should go bankrupt and we'll find companies that can manufacture safe products. You know, it's sad that the job satisfaction, the latest study on job satisfaction in the United States, it's now at its lowest level, 45%. 45% of the people in the United States are not happy at work. And one reason is, I told you, work has to be meaningful. If you want to be happy at work, you want to, it's the job of the CEO to make sure that the work is meaningful, and uh, employees should be should, shouldn't be treated as a kind of like a little bit of a little cog and uh, irrelevant. There's a whole thing you can learn in some of your courses about uh, learning organizations where employees are actually treated uh, very uh, as very important assets to a company. In the knowledge economy, the greatest asset you have the the brain power of your employees. If you're not tapping into it and not using them, you're not doing what you're not going to do well. So um, corporate social responsibility is basically, again, about um, treating your employees well, too, because that will help your company make profits. It's about treating the environment well. It's about uh, treating your customers well, caring about your customers. And, and, and viewing each employee as, as somebody with a, with a voice, somebody who, who has a potential to contribute. Yeah, that's right provide their, their yeah. point of view. That's why in many uh, companies now they're trying to get rid of these layers of layers of management. If too many layers of management, you separate the CEO from the employees and it doesn't work out very well, especially in the, you know, the internet age. You want to have a learning organization where people share ideas and they think ideas can come from anywhere in the company. And the old fashioned you know, command and control, the, uh, kind of from the army, where the general's all the way on top and you know you have no way to get to that general. That type of uh, management style is disappearing, I think. I hope it is, at least. Yeah, let's hope so. <laughs> let's hope so, because uh, I think it's reappearing in academia. <laughs> We're starting to see it in academia a little bit. But it's not really the way a, a corporation should run, because you want people who have good ideas to be able to uh, send these ideas to uh, to, to, to the uh, to the ma to manager on top of them, so can you can implement these ideas. Uh, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm editing the, uh, an issue of Journal of, of uh, uh, Ethics of and Entrepreneurship, and you, you might think ethics is one thing and entrepreneurship is another thing, but I'm, I'm convinced that um, entrepreneurship, which I associate with courage and taking risks, is really intrinsically related to ethics because 
as Professor Basso pointed out, um, sometimes ethical decisions are very difficult. And yes, in the long run, your, your mom will be very proud of you. Your children will be proud of you for making the ethical decision. But in the short run, um, there could be really uncomfortable consequences of, for making ethical decisions. And these are really the ethical, the interesting ethical dilemmas that we're concerned about, right? Um, we're not talking about situations where um, doing the ethical thing is the easy thing to do. So um, ethics, leadership, um, Creativity, um, they're all related concepts, courage um, and uh, communication. I think they're all, uh, they're all part, of, part of the same idea that we're talking about. Yeah, as we were talking about this, what if students want jobs, what do they have to show on their, uh, on their resumes? And we talked about, the yeah, talks about the four C's. Right. Right? Communication. So, communication. Um, creativity is one of them, to show that you have a creative mind, because that's, a good company wants creative minds, creativity, critical thinking, that you know how to think. That's what this video is about, is to have you think th things through. And see, things are not so simple always. And not everything is black and white, and you've got to know how to make a decision. See, critical thinking and collaboration. We talk about learning organizations. You have to know how to work with others. That's why diversity is becoming important. And if you're in a company where it's all white men, IT is notorious now for not having enough women and uh, studies are starting to show that if you want to have ideas, you have to have diversity. I'm talking about all kinds of diversity. It's not only about women, it's about minorities, and IT companies don't have enough of that. And uh, Alibaba was, uh, was in the news last week, uh, the CEO of Alibaba was proud of the fact they had more women in management positions and working for the company than any other IT company, more than Google, more than Facebook, it's just amazing. And he, he called it, I think he, he's a strange term, I'm not familiar with it, secret sauce. He called it uh, women. The fact that so many women were, uh, in management, that's his secret sauce. I wouldn't use that term necessarily, but okay. You know, but he meant as a secret weapon, I guess. That's the term we would right. use. In the, no, diversity is a secret weapon, and some companies are finding out that if you encourage diversity, that's also part of uh, being a socially responsible company, bringing in all kinds of, again, common sense. If you have a, uh, 20 white men you basically, it's like one person multiplied 20 times. You don't have that diversity of ideas. But if you have all kinds of different people, each one with, you bring in some disabled people. And they have different ideas. They're the ones who will give you some great ideas about products, because they all understand how hard it is to use certain products, you know, if you're disabled. So these are just some examples of uh, another thing a CEO should be able to see, the value of diversity. But again, that's what we're trying to do in this tape, is to show that the, uh, the old group, we'll get back to the beginning, greed is good, right. and focusing on the CEO and one person is not good. Altruism is good. Dis what, disabled yeah. people also have the effect of inspiring you. Mm -hmm. and when you see somebody who has all these um, uh, limitations, mm -hmm. and they're able to succeed and be motivated, and so you say to yourself, you know, uh, I, I need to go and step outside my comfort zone, too. Mm -hmm. And actually, you know, we've talked about this, but studies that show when you have a group and there's some women there, the group is much more effective. By the way, putting ten geniuses together, you would think that the, the IQ of the group has increased ten geniuses. It doesn't work that way. It's kind of like in baseball, ten home run hitters, and the team loses because they're all concerned about themselves. That's not uh, teamwork, because a collaboration is so important. If you show on your resume that you know how to collaborate with people from all walks of life, that's a valuable skill. I know one of my kids who works in IT, and she's a manager, told me, you know, she had a genius there once. Destroyed morale, she had to get rid of them. The genius part of computer programming didn't help if you can't work with anyone. You've got to know how to work with others. It's also a lot of these ideas that uh, sound philanthropic or something, you know, uh, are really actually helping a company. These ideas of concern about uh, your employees and bringing in diversity and business ethics. This actually makes you a much stronger company. And, and that's what we're doing now, right? We're learning from each other and yeah, that's we're, right. we're all uh, sharpening our own uh, perspectives. Exactly. In fact, uh, Daniel Kahneman, one of the great uh, Nobel laureates, one of the most brilliant minds in social science, talks about adversarial collaboration. When people have different mm -hmm. ideas, are forced to work together, mm -hmm. guess what? That's when you get the greatest ideas. 
You have two, ten people who agree on something, and they're all working together, like the Chicago school that you mentioned, or some Marxist school, uh, I'm not going to mention any. You know, everybody believes in Marxism. So you have ten people who believe in Marxism, you get Marxism. Okay. Uh, so you need kind of this kind of uh, adversarial collaboration where people don't agree, and they come up with ideas and share off each other's you know, uh, creativity, share each other's creativity. Mm -hmm. the, the German philosopher Hegel called it antithesis, yeah, right? That's right? Where mm -hmm. two uh, ideas um, clash with each other. Um, uh, well, the last one is synthesis. Yeah, thesis. 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 That's right. That's uh, right. That's uh, thesis, right. where yeah. you have an idea and someone else has an idea. Mm -hmm. Or you have two ideas. And antithesis, where the two ideas clash. Mm -hmm. And then the, uh, the ultimate result is uh, synthesis. Synthesis, where, yeah. Uh, you're able to reconcile different points of view. Mm -hmm. Well, that's it for now. We're going to continue this conversation online. So, on behalf of Hershey Friedman, Bill Fisher, and myself, Miles Bissell, we thank you for tuning in, and we look forward to talking about ethics and its impact on your decision making in the future. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.